This class is probability and statistics for the engineering and computing sciences is calculus based. And we're also gonna talk about, again, applications to data science and actuarial science as we go. But we wanna start basic. How do you start basic in probability and statistics? I like to think in terms of coin tossing to start with. There we have a coin. There's the tails, there's the heads. And of course we flip coins and see what it is. That one's, that, that's a weird tails. That's tails. Oh, that was a bad flip, but it came up tails again. Tails again, three tails in a row. Whoa, that was strange. What a small probability. Tails again, wow. I wasn't expecting this was happen. Rare things do happen. This is a good lesson. Tails again. Is there a heads? Yeah, there is a heads. <laughs> Tails again, what, whoa. This is like your favorite football team losing the coin toss every time. Tails again. I'm not doing this on purpose. This is amazing. Tails again. Okay, I'm gonna keep doing this until I get an actual heads. Yay, we can stop. Yes, unlikely things do happen sometimes. What do we get, like seven tails in a row there? I didn't count. Before we got ahead. Not typical. Oh, this, this brings up a great lesson, actually. If you ever teach probability and or statistics in the future, Here's an in-class assignment to give your students. Well, tell them to all bring the coins to class. I'm not gonna do this with you because we got lots of other things to do. And have them start flipping coins. Tell them to flip the coin or half the class flips a coin 50 times or 100 times. And the other half the class, maybe the teacher leaves the room, just writes down a bunch of random H's and T's. And they all hand it in the results for the flipping a coin, for people who actually flip the coin, writing down H's and T's based on what they actually got for the flip coins, and the other people who just pretended to flip coins and try to make their strings of H's and T's look random. And the goal is the professor has to decide who actually flipped the coins and who didn't. Okay, maybe it'll take time for the professor to be outside of class and decide, but how can the professor decide? The answer is this. People who write down a string of 100 H's and T's that they try to make look as random as possible rarely have anything longer than, say, four H's or T's in a row because they think it doesn't look random. Those who actually flip the coin in 100 flips are very likely somewhere in that string of 100 flips to have at least, say, six H's or six T's in a row occur somewhere. Not necessarily right away as what would happen with me here, but somewhere. And that's how the professor or teacher can decide who actually flipped the coins and who didn't. Now, is it foolproof? No, there, there could be mistakes. But generally speaking, it's a pretty good way. People have a hard time truly understanding what randomness means. So that's the first thing we wanna think about is what does randomness mean? Is that, what does probability mean? I could say that the probability of getting ahead when I flip a coin. Here's kind of standard notation for that. I could write the word head in here. P means probability. To emphasize that some books use PR for probability, but I'm lazy and just use a P. This is kind of like function notation. That's getting ahead. And when you look at this entire expression, it re represents the probability of getting ahead. It is like function notation. Probability of getting ahead. When you flip a fair coin once, what's the answer? Uh, one half? 0.5? Sure, why not? 
0.5, one half, 50%, whatever you want to say. You know, in everyday vernacular, people will say 50 50, even odds. But here's what I want you to think about what does that mean? And is it really even correct? I mean, after all, the coin is not, you know, it's got the engraving on it. From a pure physics perspective, it's not perfectly symmetric on either side. Wouldn't that affect the gravitational pull on the coin as it goes up into the air and spins around? Couldn't the physics of it cause it to spin in weird ways, especially if you flipped it really high? That maybe would cause heads to be more likely, or maybe with my, my coin tails to be more likely than heads. Maybe the answer is not really 0.5. Maybe it's 0.51 or something, or 0.47. How do you know it really is 0.5? Is that a question worth trying to answer? Mm. Basically, it's unanswerable completely. It's an unanswerable kind of question. Now you can do experiments. You can set up a system where you have some sort of robot flip the coin perfectly, really vigorously, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Maybe, maybe a million times. Will you get 500,000 heads exactly? Uh, not likely, right? That should make some sense that it wouldn't will be likely to be exactly 500,000 out of a million flips. Probably going to be somewhat close on a relative scale. But exact? That's probably not going to happen. The probability of that happening is probably pretty low of getting exactly 50% heads. And you could do some simulations like on this website, media.saplinglearning.com. I just searched for a coin simulator. And toss a coin. The probability of heads is set to 0.5 here. And you can keep track of the proportion of heads over time as you keep flipping the coin. And this one's that one went up for a while. Lots of heads in a row there. Looks like there were what, eight heads in a row? And then there was a tail and then there was a head again. I'm gonna reset that, do it again. There it's maybe more typical, more ups and downs. But only in 10 tosses here, only two times did the proportion of heads equal exactly 0.5. I could continue tossing actually, and maybe do more tosses. It's staying well under 0.5 so far. Will it ever get back up to 0.5? You would think it should. It's kind of slowly going back up there, but what's to stop it from going back down? Okay, it reached 0.5 there. Now it's above. Is it going to stay near 0.5 forevermore? Okay, let's do 100 tosses at once. Well, it's going fairly far above there. Back down now, fairly far below. Back up, staying below. Is it possible it could stay below 0.5 forever? Mm, hard to say. Oh boy, let's get back up to 0.5. Come on, come on. It's not doing it. If this is an accurate simulator, it will eventually get back to 0.5 here. That's one conclusion you can make. Eventually, it might take a while. If the if it's an accurate simulator, at least, it will eventually get back to 0.5. It's just taking a while at the moment. Getting close. Oh, very close. I can't quite tell. Can you guys see that in the back okay? And it'll eventually go above it, in fact. It's just not quite at the moment. Maybe it's not an accurate simulator, though. What we're trying to illustrate here are a couple different things. True probabilities, in some ways, you might say are unknowable. 
again, is the probability of a coin coming up heads really exactly 0.5? This evidence seems to say it's at least close to 0.5 if it's an accurate simulator. But maybe it's 0.49 or 0.4999999, but not repeating, and so it's not exactly 0.5. If it's truly 0.5, this is also illustrating something called the law of large numbers. If the probability of heads truly is 0.5, it will eventually get back to 0.5 and go above it, and then once it's above, it'll eventually go back below it again. I think it looks like it's at 0.5 right now. There we go. Oh, really close. Okay, not exactly. Dare we do it one more time? I didn't. I was, wasn't looking at the number up here. Oh, it's going away again. I was hoping it would get back sooner. It'll eventually go above it. I, I won't continue tossing here. We do see the trend is more wild at first. And it is sort of settling down with this horizontal line at 0.5, kind of like an asymptote. But it's not an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote in the sense of calculus, because it's not a typical kind of graph from calculus. It's an up and down jagged graph, whereas in calculus, you, you deal with smooth graphs. But you are sort of, it's an asymptote and you are sort of being forced toward 0.5. And yes, the jaggedness on any given scale does get smaller and smaller, harder to see as you go. What if the probability of heads is not 0.5? Like what if it's something big like 0.86 or something? What if it's not a fair coin? What happens then? Well, you're much more likely to get a bunch of heads in a row now. I mean, it happened with the previous simulation. Will it happen here? Well, again, no guarantee. Let's go back to 10 tosses. Bunch of heads in a row. We're still at 100% here of heads. So those 10 tosses, we're at 100%. Keep going here. Okay, there was a tail. Every once in a while, we get a tail. The true probability is 0.86. There were, we went below 0.86. Now we're heading back above. A similar kind of thing is happening in the long run. We are approaching the horizontal line that is supposed to represent the true probability. This is still an illustration of the law, the law of large numbers, but we're pretending the probability is not 0.5. It's something else, in this case, 0.86. But once again, is it really exactly 0.86? That's really an unknowable thing. You were just trusting that the simulation, you might say, is faithfully simulating a probability of 0.86. Let's do 100 tosses. Yep, sometimes below. Sometimes it'll be above. Come, come on. There we go. Oh, really close. There it's above now, briefly. Now back below. <clears throat> We're still illustrating the law of large numbers here. If the probability is 0.86 of heads, that means the probability of tails is point what? 0.14? Right? If it's an 86% chance of heads, it'd be a 14% chance of tails. 14% is about one out of every seven, one seventh. You would expect to get tails on about one out of every seven tosses. So like with 25 tosses, one out of every seven would mean about three or four tails. Every time the graph goes down, it's a tail. It went down once, then twice. Okay, there it went down twice. If I do it again, you know, it could go down three or four times, once, twice, three times. Where those down 
things occur, where the tails occur is impossible to say because of randomness. You don't know what the outcome is going to be for sure. Probability is about describing things in the long run. But when we do our work in this class, we are often writing equations like this and saying the probability is exactly 0.5. But wait a minute, is that really right again? This is the difference between the probabilities being an accurate description of reality and doing pure math problems where you assume things. When I say a coin flip is fair, I'm saying, I'm saying assume the probability of heads on any one flip is 0.5, exactly. It's an assumption for the sake of simplicity. Get what I'm saying? In reality, it may not be exactly 0.5, but it seems reasonable that if you're flipping it well, it should at least be close to 0.5. So why not just go ahead and make things simple and assume it's 0.5? And that's what we mostly do in this class is we make modeling assumptions and go from there. Because if we didn't, then we couldn't get exact. We couldn't write down answers. We couldn't do calculations that gives us answers that are exact in their mathematical formulation, but you might say approximate in the application to real life. What I'm talking about now is important for understanding what probability is really about, though it's not the main thing we do in this course. Mainly we are doing calculations and getting what seem to be exact answers. But this is a modeling assumption. It's a modeling, my finger's wet, modeling assumption. In particular, we say it's a fair coin. Fair, not in the sense of it being nice weather, but you know, fair in the sense that it, it's coming up heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time. It's not an unfair coin or an unfair pair of dice that you might encounter if you were in a casino, right? They're trying to make you lose. It's not weighted purposely against you to come up heads or to fail to come up heads. but it is a modeling assumption. So let's continue with the modeling assumptions in kind of typical situations to think about probability. And again, we start simple. Continue with the coin tossing. Here is our random experiment described simply as flip a fair coin once. and observe the result. Wait a minute, didn't we just do that? Yeah, but now I'm being a little bit more official about it. Mathematical, ultimately. I'm trying to construct models of random experiments. We assume the models are accurate. And based on that assumption, we go ahead and do calculations to compute probabilities. And then we're usually satisfied with the probability as being the answer that we're after. Again, whether that fits real life or not, not always the case because your modeling assumptions might be wrong. How do you come up with a mathematical model of this, a probability model? probability model. You start with something called a sample space. S. Sample space. What's the sample space? It's the set, the collection of all possible outcomes. 
So when you flip a coin once, what can happen? You could get heads, you could get tails. Theoretically, the coin could land on its side and not fall down on heads or tails. Theoretically, a gorilla could come in this room and eat the coin as it's in the air. And I say that only half jokingly because there was one day where I was teaching a class and a gorilla came through the room. You think I'm lying? No, I'm not lying. Or, well, I'm only sort of lying. It, of course, it was a person in a gorilla costume. I didn't know what was going to happen. It was fourth floor in this in this building. 15 years ago or so, I was teaching a class and somebody dressed in a gorilla costume opened the door. I didn't know it was going to happen and screamed as they ran across the back of the room. I'm not trying to give you ideas, okay? I don't think you should do it, but I'm telling you it happened. I didn't know it was going to happen. Was it a probability statistics class? I, I don't think it was. I think it was a calculus class. But that was an unlikely event that happened that day. And what if I had been happened to be flipping a coin in the back of the room? Technically, the gorilla could have caught it as I was flipping it. I, I just didn't realize it was going to happen. That, that could have happened. For the sake of modeling, we ignore such possibilities, right? The coin could explode, disintegrate, ignore that possibility. The possibilities are that it comes up heads or tails, right? That's our model. There's only two possibilities. Notice I'm using curly braces. Sometimes people call them curvy braces because they are curvy, but I think the more official name is curly braces. To indicate this is a set, I didn't make the curly braces very good. A collection of two possible outcomes, H and T. Of course, H represents heads and T represents tails. This is a very simple sample space, just two elements in it. Two outcomes. These are called outcomes. Well, is that it? Is, are we done with the probability model? No, because there's nothing about probability yet. Now we have to assign probabilities. How do you do that? Well, it, it seems reasonable, especially since we're saying it's a fair coin, <coughs> to say the probability of heads is 0.5 and the probability of tails is therefore also 0.5. Assign probabilities. Probability of heads is 0.5 and probability of tails is also 0.5. We could think of it as one minus the probability of heads, if you like. One minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. Mathematically speaking, the important thing is that the sum of the probabilities is one with regard to modeling real life coin tossing. It's also important that we use 0.5 instead of 0.86 and 0.14. But from a mathematical perspective, if we use 0.86 here and 0.14 there, it would still be a valid probability model, just not accurate. You get what I'm trying to get across? This is important ultimately for applications you do pure math and statistics in this class, but when you use this stuff on the job, you do need to think about accuracy. Is it not just a valid model, but is it is it a reasonably accurate model? But again, since I use the word fair here, that's why we also make these that be 0.5 and therefore this is also 0.5. And again, if this had been 0.86, this one would be 1 minus 0 0.86, 0 
you want the sum of these to equal one. Because of this, you can also write that the probability of something in the sample space occurring is the sum of these two, since they H and T make up the sample space. <clears throat> And since the set containing just H is what's called disjoint from the set containing just T, I'm using set notation in the in here, but I, I wouldn't really have to. We see that the probability that something in the sample space occurs is one, as you would expect. We're about to do a more complicated model where things aren't quite this simple, but they'll still be pretty simple. So again, the key things in this model are the sample space has to be described, probabilities have to be assigned so that the probabilities of the individual outcomes sum to one, and the fair coin assumption means these outcomes are equally likely. So I assign probabilities of one half to both of them. Notice those are not negative numbers. Probabilities are never negative. If you ever get a negative answer for a probability, you've done something wrong. If it's on a test and you get a negative answer, I'll probably give you a bonus point if you say, hey, I know this can't be right, but I don't have time to fix it if you at least acknowledge that it's wrong because you can't get negative probabilities and I'm not going to try to trick you. Probabilities also can't be bigger than one. You can't say the probability is two. You could say it's 2%, but realize when you say 2%, that's not a number bigger than one because 2% means two per hundred. It means two over a hundred percent means per hundred. So it's 0 0.02, so it's not bigger than one. 2% is not the number two, it's the number 0 0.02. They have to add to one here as well. <clears throat> All right, on to our second experiment. Exper uh, another random experiment. I guess that was random experiment one. Here's random experiment two, I didn't use a one, but you could label it with the one before. Now we flip a fair coin twice, or maybe you flip two fair coins at the same time. I'll think of it as one fair coin twice. Fair coin twice and observe the outcome. And by outcome in that case, I mean the thing that happens when you consider both flips, <clears throat> not just one flip. What's our probability model now? What's the sample space, first of all? Again, S is the sample space. <clears throat> you're considering when you flip this fair coin twice, what happens both times considered as one experiment? What could happen? Well, you could get two heads in a row. You could get a head, then a tail. You could get a tail, then a head. You could get two tails in a row. There's four things that could happen, ignoring coins exploding and things like that. H, H. H T T H T T. Notice I'm using the curly braces again to emphasize this is a set, a collection. By the way, with sets, the ordering doesn't matter. I could write these same outcomes in a different order. It would still be the same set. That's worth emphasizing. 
it's the right answer for the sample space any way you write this list. Actually, it would even, wouldn't even matter if I rewrote one of these again. If I put another TT, it would still be the same set. There's no reason to put another TT, but if you put another TT, it's still the same set. It's not a wrong answer. Those again are the outcomes. There are four outcomes. The individual elements of the set are outcomes. Again, we're saying it's a fair coin. So that's a modeling assumption. That means each time you flip the coin, the probability of heads is 0.5 and the probability of tails is 0.5, which I hope intuitively means you would say that must mean each one of these outcomes is also equally likely. And since there's four outcomes, the probability of each one should be one fourth, right? 0.25, is that a proof? It's not really a proof of that fact, but it should seem reasonable. Are we gonna prove that fact? Um, not now, though <laughs> ultimately it's always based on assumptions. To prove it, you also need something called independence. The result of the first flip doesn't affect the second flip. That's called independence. You technically need that assumption as well. But if you're doing vigorous flipping, it's a reasonable assumption for the purposes of modeling. Assign probabilities. For each outcome, PHH, that'll be one fourth. PHT, that'll also be one fourth. PTH, that'll also be one fourth. And PTT, that'll also be one fourth. Of course, you can also write these as 0.25. You can also write them as 25%. Any way you write it like this is okay. Technically, you could also write it as any equivalent fraction, like 25 or over 100 or 50 over 200, but you might as well reduce the fraction if you can. <clears throat> Notice these are all between zero and one, and they add to one. The probability of something in the sample space occurring is one, 100%. One of these four things is gonna occur. Ignoring exploding coins and gorillas and stuff, okay? For the purposes of model. <clears throat> Something new in this context, besides having more outcomes, is that we can also talk about the probability of other kinds of events. I guess I, I emphasize that word events. That's another technical word that you're going to see in the reading. What technical words have we had so far? We've had sample space, probability, uh, outcome. Here's a new word, event. What's an event? Mathematically speaking, an event is a subset of the sample space a sub-collection. When you think about applying this in real life, events are all often just described in words, like flip a fair coin twice, what's the probability of getting at least one head? That phrase, at least one head, is an event. You could get at least one head, meaning one or more heads. probability of getting at least one head. We can describe our events with words. It's the same as the probability 
of getting an outcome in the set containing at least one H. What are all the outcomes with at least one H? They're, they're the first three. H, 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 T, T, H. I hope it's reasonable sounding to say the answer has got to be three fourths. We can think of this as the sum of these individual probabilities for these individual sets of one outcome. I'm using the curly braces to emphasize that I could think of these as one outcome sets and each of those as having a probability of one fourth. So saying the final answer is indeed three fourths or 0.75. Do you have to show your work this way? Isn't this kind of a pain? No, you don't have to in this context, at least. You'll also see formulas like this. If you call this event, if you give this event a name, the common name is capital E for event. You could also write a formula for this probability as N of E divided by N of S, where N represents the number of outcomes in E for N of E and the number of outcomes in S for N of S. And then since there's three outcomes in E and four outcomes in S, the answer is three fourths. You could write your answer this way. This approach technically only should be used, first of all, if your sample space is finite. We are gonna deal with infinite sample spaces though. So don't use this if S has infinitely many elements. You need to do something else in that case. And it also only works if each outcome is assumed to be equally likely. And we are making that assumption. This approach, where you add the probabilities of the individual outcomes, generalizes to other situations where these sets don't have any elements in common. They're disjoint sets. In probability, we call those mutually exclusive events. I will continue saying all these words, these technical words, sample space, probability, outcome, event, mutually exclusive. I'll continue saying these words in, in future classes, okay? And you'll read about them. They are important to get the, the foundation right. This kind of thing generalizes to many situations, including where your sample space is infinite. You can't use your, this formula when the sample space is infinite because you'd be dividing by infinity, which you can't do. I mean, in some classes, you might say if you divide by infinity, you got to get zero. Well, that's not the case if you're doing infinity over infinity. That's a indeterminate form. You need L'Hopital's rule. Of, well, we're not doing that. Okay, you can just expunge that from your mind, but I just said that, if that's confusing. But E is a subset of S. Events, technically speaking, are subsets of the sample space. That notation there means subset, subcollection. Sets are collections. E is a subcollection of S, subset, and that's the notation for subset that you should know. Kind of looks like a less than or equal to, but it's not. Don't make it pointy. In class on Thursday, we'll continue doing more complicated models, including maybe a model with coin toss, uh, dice rolling, and maybe decks of cards. Hang on to that handout, okay? We'll see you on Thursday.